My name is K.B. Paul. I'm going to be the moderator of this session this morning. I work for Lincoln University Cooperative Extension. I'm a state extension specialist. And as I said, I'm also co-coordinator for the SARE program. Today, uh, we have as speaker, uh, Mr. Garrett Greider. He's going to talk to us a real education lesson learned from farm to school program. All right. Thank you. For you. Appreciate it. I'll take this out, I think. Um, yes, my name is Garrett Greider. Um, I am a recent graduate from Truman State University. Uh, Truman State University is a liberal arts college in uh, Kirksville, Missouri, so the, the Northeast Missouri region. Um, and actually, this uh, what I'm about to talk to you about is a farm to school program. It was uh, its origins were back, started back in 2011. Of course, before that, uh, a couple years they had started a sustainability initiative at Truman. So within that, they had formed a committee. Within that sustainability initiative, they wanted to. One of the big things they wanted to get into the college program was uh, local foods. So uh, we had access to us um, a university farm, 400 acres, and we had uh, we have cattle, a uh, lot of livestock out there, and uh, plenty plenty of uh, fields for growing crops. So we th thought, you know, we can do this out here. So the agriculture agriculture department there kind of took on the project for uh, the local foods demand we had there, and also. Um, Within that sustainability initiative, we also do biodiesel from uh, waste vegetable oil from the cafeterias. We also have a composting project where food scraps from the cafeterias are taken back out to the university farm, and we have a, a compost, um, an area designated for composting. And uh, within, just it wasn't just a, it was a collaborative effort of the whole campus, really. So it wasn't just the ag department. We have some. I have some other organizations listed there. ECO, which is an, the environmental campus organization, they're very active on campus. Um, and the Rot Riders, they uh, take care of the compost and truck it out to the farm every day. So they're great to have. Um, we'll move on. Uh, we, uh, we received a USDA grant in 2011 um, by the department chair, Michael Seipel of the Ag Department. He wrote this. Um, at the time, I was still a student, actually. Um, I got my degree in ag business. Um, and then once we got the grant, um, we began to uh, plan for what, we're, what we needed uh, to produce fruits and vegetables. That's what it specifically was for. Um, we, we had five and a half acres total of uh, fruit and vegetable production. So that's, I mean, that's quite a lot to manage. So to, fi to be able to manage those fields, we decided we needed a uh, position and that position we decided to call local foods coordinator. Um, so that, that position was responsible for mostly the operations. That's my current, current position. At the time when this program was established, I was still a student, like I said. So we had a different one. Um, but the local foods coordinator is in charge of all the operations. So that's, you know, basically uh, you're out there. It's all hands on. You're doing everything from the, from the growing of the crops, starting them, starting them indoors, you know, you have to learn, you know, have to use how the tractors, how to hook up the implements. Um, some of the implements that we, that we felt very useful for our production was, uh, of course, a rotary tiller. Um, that's, that's pretty standard, prepares a fine seabed um, real quickly, you know. And then uh, also from uh, Morgan County Seed Company, which is actually here today, was where we purchased a lot of this stuff. We have a uh, plastic mulch layer. You know, that was the hold down. I'm sure you all have seen this before, but suppress the weeds, um, holds the moisture, and it, we lay drip irrigation under it, which came in really handy this year, you know, with the drought. Um, it pretty much saved us, and, you know, it, it, was, it was okay. It worked out, you know. Like I like, I like to say, I, with, with the drought, you can, always, you can always add water to so the soil, but you can't take it away. So I'd rather have a drought than an than excessive rainy season. Um, we also had a Holland transplanter. If anyone's seen those, it's uh, hooks to the three-point hitch of a tractor, and you sit. You, they have one person that sits in the back, and it's got a carousel, and these that goes around like this. And you just drop uh, transplants that you've planted into flats. Um, once those are ready to go out in the field, you just you have someone that sit. There's a tray that lines up, and you you set your flat on that with your transplants in it. And as you're going down your row this carousel spinning and you just drop those 
transplants down in there. Then the Holland Transplanter Company, I believe, is out of Michigan or Minnesota, but it's uh, it's a cost-effective implement and well worth the uh, if you're doing large larger scale production like we were five and five and a half acres for fruits and vegetables a lot. So that's something uh, that came in really handy and didn't have to do everything by hand, which would have would have been very difficult. Um, we also had a water wheel planter, which we got from Morgan County Seed Company, and that's. That's actually for transplanting through black plastic. Once you have that black plastic mulch laid down, um, it will punch holes depending on what your spacing is. And you can put in, you know, we used it for mostly for tomatoes and peppers and some uh, cabbages too is what we did on plastic. And uh, some other equipment listed there. And then we also, uh, with, within the grant funding, we were able to set up a processing kitchen there at Truman. Um, so we have a full function functioning processing kitchen which has oven and range with canning supplies. We do canning, we teach that at the university. Um, also have a dehydrator which we use a lot for tomatoes, um, commercial walk-in coolers to keep our stuff uh, uh, fresh and so we can, when we're selling it to the cafeterias and whatnot, and then some other things there. This is, I just wanted to show you some pictures of uh, what our equipment looks like. The one in the top left, that's the plastic mulch layer. I actually saw one over there uh, at this exhibit. It's, it's, like I said, it's, it's real quick and effective. You see us down there utilizing it. You just need one person on the tractor, and then you need two people uh, on the back to run it. Um, you just, once it's lifted up, you're, you, got, you got your uh, ground rotor tilled there. You're gonna, both, both of us in the back there will bend down, hold it under the wheels, He'll let down the implement, and he'll continue to go down the row. And it has, uh, wheel, it has wheels that pack it into the dirt and throw dirt on the side, so it makes it real firm. Um, there in the middle there is that that's the water wheel planter. And here in the bottom, you can see it loaded up with uh, looks like there's there's melons there, watermelons, um, transplants that we planted on black plastic. So it's gonna punch a hole every so and it's going to fill that hole with water get it real moist um, and then you're just as you're going down you're in a low gear and there's two actually there's two seats back there so you have someone on each side just plugging those into the uh, into the black plastic once it punches a hole real easy um, this was the second year for our for our production the first year we did not have this water wheel planter so everything that was planted on plastic we had to take a tomato steak jab a hole in and then, you know, put it in by hand. So that took what is usually a week's job down to a day's job. So planting on all that black plastic. So definitely worth the price. It's got big tanks you can fill with water. And that, that, that top right picture is the Holland transplanter I was ta talking about. It's uh, just a single person in the back. Has, you load up the trays just like you do on this one. And you can kind of see the, the uh, cylinders right here. It just spins around and you drop them down in as it goes, and it's it's for planting on bare soil, so not not on black plastic. So some people use them in like no-till systems. Um, through through this program, we established uh, what we call Market on the Mall. It's the first ever campus farmers market at Truman State University. You know, and I'm not sure what if other universities are doing these or not. I think Mizzou might do do one. Um, we do one every Wednesday though. Uh, through August through October, or until you know until we have a frost, which is early this year, unfortunately. But uh, from 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 noon to five every Wednesday, students, faculty, staff, community members they come to campus. We're located uh, right on right in front of the student union building. We bring all our fresh produce from the university farm that's harvested either the day before or that that morning. Um, we bring it, and we have live music. We have um, it's a high trafficked area. Those are some of my tips that kind of helped helped us. You know, where we put it in a high traffic area. We did a lot of promotion. We had signage. You can see our uh, big banner in the back. Um, we also had banners hanging around campus. Um, music, of course, people love the music. And uh, we at first here we don't have uniforms, but eventually we, you can kind of see it in this picture. We decided to get uniforms. That really really uh, accentuates things. I think. Um, like I said, it was great. The community came out. It was real popular. It's one of the the greatest projects we have going at Truman State University. Um, you know, it's a lot. It's good for good for the students, especially. We our prices. We uh, 
you know, we, we price them under what conventional produce are at the uh, grocery store. So generally you're going to pay more for local fresh food, but because, you know, we're just trying to be a positive image on campus, we make it affordable for the people that are there. So, and we also, I didn't mention, but we sell direct to uh, the cafeterias. That's uh, their Sodexo. So that's, that's a big challenge in itself, and I'll get more into that. Um, but this, the, the cafeterias decided they would use our food too. Uh, this, I just want to give you a little bit of statistics on what we're growing out there in our five and a half acres. Uh, tomatoes is our main crop just because they're the most profitable for us to sell. And, I mean, they're pretty easy, easy to grow. I think everyone can do it. So we had, uh, we had two, over 2,000 plants, and we focus on uh, – you know, the heirlooms are great, but for what we're doing, you know, we're trying to make, um, you know, you're selling at the cafeterias and you're selling directly to the people. Oftentimes they want, you know, they don't want the, with your heirlooms, they're, they get kind of mangly and crazy. I mean, they're great. I, I like them, but people just, they want perfection. So, uh, and that's what they want in the cafeterias too, because they last, they last longer. So those are some of the varieties we grow that seem to do well. Uh, we grow all our tomatoes outside, um, mountain fresh. Prime time. Those were probably our two best. Sweet Chelsea was a cherry tomato that did the best for us. Um, we just we use tomatoes, tomato steaks, um, and then we do the Florida weave. If you're familiar with that, that's how we trellis them up. Um, we do about hundred foot rows on plastic. Um, on the ends, we do metal T posts for extra rigidness, and then uh, in the in between, we do just wooden posts. And uh, the Florida weave is, for those that are familiar, as that tomato plant's growing up, you have string that attaches to your hip. And you uh, have a PVC pipe where you put that string through. And uh, you tie it off on the end of the, end of the uh, metal T-post. And you just go down and you wrap it around each one of those wooden, wooden stakes. And uh, you, do, you go down both sides. And as, as it's growing up, it's just holding, holding that tomato plant up. So... And mostly we focus on determinants, so eventually they stop growing, so uh, they don't get too crazy. Some of the indeterminates will just go wild. Um, peppers, that's another big one for us. Uh, solanaceous crops in general are big ones, so you got potatoes too. But uh, peppers, we had over 1,000 plants, mostly bells, some hot peppers. Hot peppers we sell mostly at market because the uh, we noticed that the uh, cafeterias and like we also would sell to High V a little bit in Kirksville. They just weren't interested in, in uh, hot specialty peppers. They wanted just big bell peppers. Um, cucumbers, we had 450 feet trellis. That's a lot of cucumbers. Um, that's a football field and, a, and then another half of a football field, if you could imagine just how many cucumber plants that would be. Uh, potatoes, we do two acres just because potatoes are an easy seller, um, pretty easy to grow. They don't take a lot of work. Um, they're also uh, can be stored for a pretty long time. So we actually sold out of our potatoes already of our two acres, which we sold all to the cafeteria at Truman. Melons, that's another thing that we do pretty large, large amount of, watermelons especially. We, uh, we don't do the seedless ones just because seedless ones are harder to grow, believe it or not. We, we like the uh, open pollinated, um, like your Crimson Sweet, Desert King. Desert King was the most drought-tolerant one we had this year. If you're familiar with that, it's a yellow flesh waterman with big black seeds. It uh, does really well in this drought. And uh, pumpkins, we do two acres. Um, and summer squash, that's their other big ones. And then you can see we also uh, have some other smaller crops down there that I listed. And we're also, we just now got into uh, cover cropping. So in our potato field, we uh, decided to plant that in buckwheat after the potato harvest was over. It's just to add organic matter, um, suppress this weeds. We had problems with uh, cockaburrs, uh, velvet leaf, uh, morning glories. So uh, that's why we decided to put that, just to add fertility to. And then also in our melon field, one acre melon field, we put tillage radishes. They're, uh, they're big, uh, white radishes that break up clay soils. Uh, northeast Missouri, we have clay soils. Um, so they go down, break it up, and they have extensive root systems that go down and pick up nitrogen from the, the bot from that's harbored down in the bottom. It'll pick, that up, pick it up and make it usable for next season. That's kind of a new thing a lot of farmers are doing, even conventional farmers with like corn, they do corn and soybeans. So we're, we're excited about that. They grew, they grew pretty well, and uh, hopefully next, they're going to, 
make our close clay soils a little bit better to work with. Uh, uh, tillage radish, they also call it groundhog radish and uh, forage radish. A lot of people will graze their livestock on them too. Li they're real nutri nutritious for livestock. And you can actually eat them yourself. They're real, sometimes, they actually call them, in J Japan, they call them daikons. So if you've heard of that. So um, just wanted to show you pictures of our, our harvest right here. So we got specialty peppers. Like I said, we only sold at, sold at our market. You got bananas, cherry bombs, and anchos. Um, garlic that we sold at market too. Cherry, or uh, yeah, cherry tomatoes there, and those are our potatoes. So down there, I said kind of listed where we sell our stuff. Um, so s the food company Sodexo, that's you know that's a challenge because they want everything perfect, unblemished. Um, you gotta harvest it, wash it. Um, they're they're real particular. Your prices, of course, you don't get as good with them either because they want everything in bulk, and they want to be they want to know ahead of time what you're gonna have, which is oftentimes hard to predict. So that's why I really enjoyed having the, uh, our weekly farmer market, Mark on the Mall, just because it was, you know, people, seems like our customers, you know, they were willing to pay a little bit more uh, for their produce. Um, they could, we could bring an array of stuff. And uh, it would, you know, because everybody was looking for something different. It didn't have to bring a bunch of bulk stuff. So we could kind of focus on a bunch of different little crops. And uh, we also sold to some local establishments there in Kirksville. So on the square, we have Costa Rican Cafe Co. and Sweet Expressions, both both kind of little novelty coffee shops that, uh, you know, there's kind of a revolution going up there in northeast Missouri with getting back to the land, kind of like around going around everywhere, but especially up there where it's really rural. There's a big demand for, like, local foods and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of act, activism of, you know, people trying to get in, get into that niche market. And uh, Hy-Vee, we also sold the Hy-Vee. They... In their, in their produce stand, they have a little small area for local foods. Um, just wanted to give you a little bit of our relationships and communities. So if any of you are maybe interested in doing a farm to school program, this is kind of what, what else we've done here in Kirksville. Um, so we have the Green Thumb Project. The uh, Kirksville Elementary School actually has a, a they have a school garden. Uh, kids, it's good for the kids. That after, it's an after school project. So when school's over, they... Uh, can come out, garden, they ha have responsibilities, weekly, weekly duties, um, and they, they, they also sell at the, the kids also get marketing experience because they sell at the uh, Kirksville Farmer's Market, which is every Saturday, so it's a great thing for the elementary school. Then we also have the Jameson Street Garden, which is always uh, staffed by a Truman student, and what that does is they, they get experience gardening that way, and then the, the the proceed or the the food that's taken from that garden is donated to a, a local food pantry in town. Um, we have a local foods dinner. It's a biannual thing put on by the uh, eco eco club, which I told you about. It's uh, it's it's an invitation to local farmers. Every everything there prepared is uh, food fr from the region, um, and it just kind of celebrates the work we've done at the university farm and it, and and farmers in that region. It's uh, it's great, and uh, we've we also my the interns within the program. I don't know if I mentioned it. There's two full time interns, so two students get the chance to do all this hands on May through October, the growing season, um, getting their hands dirty. And part of part of their internship is to do service work with other local farmers. So we'll go out and they they can get to see how other people are doing it. Just have some listed in the area. Um, some farmers that farms that they've got to go to actually Green Valley Farm is owned by Steve Salt. He's actually speaking today on uh, eth eth ethnic vegetables, so that might be a good one to go to later. Um, he's he's a really smart horticulturist. Then we also worked with MU Extension a lot and had uh, events out at the farm from them. Um, so the future of farm to school program, our biggest challenges I feel like were uh, marketing. That's something that takes a lot of trial and error, you know. I can figure out how to grow all this stuff, you know. I've been doing this for three years now, and uh, pretty much got that down of how to grow it. Um, it's the marketing, which I've struggled with. Uh, you know, the, the d demand's there, but just getting it all coordinated is very difficult, I feel like. So if you got good marketing skills, you can really do this. 
successfully. Um, you know, you kind of got to, I feel you got to balance your direct, your direct sales to the customer and then, then your other sales to like, you know, your high V and institutions. Like I said, the, the institutions and the, the businesses such as hy V, they're looking for the, you know, your hybrids, um, stuff that's unblemished, just they like bulk orders. They want to know two weeks to a week ahead of time what you're going to have, and they want a consistent, consistent um, flow of produce. So, you know, that takes a lot of planning. So you got to keep that in mind. If you're going to be selling to those kind of outlets, you know, you got to be able to keep your planning planting schedules, you know, always think about planting, um, repetition, when you got to really be uh, able to focus in on that. Um, other thing with spoilage and waste, you know, you know, whether it was from inclement weather, um, disease, you know, you could have big crop losses. Um, if you couldn't get stuff moved, some of those crops, you know, once they're harvested, they got to be go gone in days. So you need to have... Uh, you need to have a market there pretty soon, or else it's just going to go to the compost pile. So there was that, and then undesirable crops. Like, there were some crops that we grew that just, people were just, just didn't want them, you know. Uh, something we grew that grew real well was uh, garden huckleberries, and that's not something a lot of people know what they are. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're for actually for making pies, and uh, they're pretty good, but not a lot of people knew what they were. They didn't want to mess with them. They took extra processing. <clears throat> so there was a little bit of waste there. So like I said, the crops that people seem to like the best, from my experience, are the solanaceous ones, your tomatoes, peppers, potatoes. Those sell real well. Can't go wrong with them. Um, some of the successes we had, really engaged the community <coughs> with Truman and northeast, the northeast Missouri, Kirksville, and you know the uh, community there and other small towns around it. That was important for us. We always... We was going to make sure that we're uh, working together. Um, it was very practical skills for those interns involved. You know, this wasn't, I kind of like education, academia is great, but I kind of like to, this is more of a real world experience, I think, for them. You know, they got to learn all the ins and outs and how, you know, how to run a business, basically. Um, so that was good, good experience. There was a lot of entertainment. We have fun out there. Um, it provides entertainment for the campus, for the community. It's, uh, it's a good, it's a good uh, presence on campus. And, of course, the aesthetics, it makes the farm look beautiful. Our, you know, that's, we really focus on keeping everything up there at the farm. And it's great. It's delicious. So, <laughs> so anyone have any questions? Yes. Garrett, good job. But my question is, how do you go about getting your produce into the local food market? Sure. Like for your grocery stores and that kind of thing? Is there? Well, well, for us, it was, uh, we used a guy that was, uh, he was a produce mover. That was his job. He owns, uh, his business is called Little Beeb's Produce. And he, his, fa his name is Mark Slaughter. And he's from La Plata, Missouri. And he, um, he also has a farm called Sunrise Farm, but that's not his main focus. His main focus is to go around to other horticultural enterprises, pick up their produce, <coughs> and take it to these uh, establishments like Hy-Vee. Um, really, if you just need to talk to the produce manager at your grocery, if you're looking to sell at a grocery store, talk to the produce manager. Some of them have strict regulations. Some of them are, you know, very atomistic about taking local produce without even really thinking about it. So it's just going to depend on depend on the person, really. So, yeah, welcome. Do you have a question? Say so first, congratulations on your success. Thank it you. sounds pretty awesome. Um, I'm interested in doing something like this in my community, too. And I was curious. I walked in a few minutes later. I don't know, maybe you covered this, but could you kind of go through how this came to be i mean was this something that the university set up did they have people the marketing especially is the part of them kind of wondering how to get going how to get people interested in this mm -hmm. so was it a group of students that kind of came up with this idea or was it a, a professor that got students together what how did this how did this come to be right it well it came together the origins were uh, back in 2011 and uh it was it wasn't just a st it was it was a collaborative effort i would say of the entire campus um 
it's a liberal art, Truman's a liberal arts school, so there's a lot of a, a students from the St. Louis, Kansas City area that are interested in this alternative agriculture production. You know, a lot of them had attended farmers markets and whatnot, and they just were looking local local foods was something that came up uh, when they passed the sustainab sustainability initiative back about three or four years ago. Within that initiative, they wanted local foods. They wanted to keep the biodiesel production going on campus, and they wanted to keep the compost project going. Um, so it was a collaborative effort between the students, faculty, and staff and the, uh, to, to get the local foods. They had already had a local foods dinner every, every semester established, but there was really, other than they had a small garden plot on campus called the Community University Garden, where they were growing like salad greens, which the, the cafeteria was buying, but it wasn't, that plot wasn't any bigger than this area right here. So once, once that gr grant was received, USDA specialty crop grant, um, they, they focused all the fruit and vegetable production to be deemed at the university farm, which was uh, five and a half acres. So, you know, it went from a garden plot this size to one that was five and a half acres big. So, and it, it's uh, the farm to school program, if you're familiar with that. So I can get you information on that later if you want. So. As far as monetary, you know, I actually don't know, but um, I never, because I never asked. They get, they received it before. I like I said when I was a student. I want to say is probably in the range between fifty to a hundred thousand, somewhere around there. So, anyways. Sodexo. Uh, did that go to the university or the public school? Uh, it went to the university. That's the Sodexo is the uh, food contractor for the university, and uh, so we would, you know, whenever they would give us weekly orders, maybe probably about two a week. So we we focus on harvesting that, and we bring it to them uh, that day actually, because the, the farm's only one mile from campus. Campus actually, so they would uh, just call call me up, say, hey, we we need this this week. If you have it, bring it. If you don't, you know, I, I need to order it. So lots of times they'd like to know a week ahead of time because that's they have to they have to do their orders a week a week to two between one to two weeks ahead of time. So it was always they always wanted a heads up. But sometimes they could take just take stuff um, just on a quick order if if they thought they could. So yeah, there definitely is. That's what we want to try and do. Um, like I said, in the elementary school there in Kirksville, they do have the garden. Um, they don't use that for, for their own use yet. Hopefully they will, but we're trying to get more into the uh, public schools. And with the farm to school program, I was looking at statistics in Missouri. I, there's already 78 schools in Missouri that are utilizing it. So I think they're located more towards your metropolitan areas right now, but hopefully that'll continue to expand across Missouri, so. Thank you.